The 2023 MLB season has been strange, and heading into the playoffs, it got even weirder. In Chicago, there were reports that a woman hid a firearm under her belly fat to sneak it into a game, accidentally wounding two people, and the game continued like nothing happened. The Athletics gave legend Miguel Cabrera one of the worst and inappropriate retirement gifts of all time. A team's grounds crew literally almost ruined a team's entire season. We've had multiple players basically disappear. We saw the most feared teams collapse. Some of the least expecting teams become the best teams, literally fighting for the last playoff spot and multiple teams who saw their playoff odds go from over 90% only to choke them away at the very last minute. The playoff table is set, and it's nothing like we thought it was going to be at the beginning of the season. The New York Mets enter the year with the highest payroll of all time, had an 85% chance to make the playoffs in April, and had Max Scherzer and Justin Verlander. They finished with neither of them on the team and the fourth worst record in the NL. The Cardinals came into the year as heavy favorites to win the Central. They finished last in the worst division in baseball. The Yankees entered the year with an 80% chance to make the playoffs. They finished 18 games back of first place. The Padres were favored to win their division. Six months later, a former staffer says it's the most toxic clubhouse ever. Another anonymous source says the manager and GM's relationship is unfixable. According to a report, players think the team hired a spy to gather information from players and relay it to the front office. Juan Soto told the media that the team, quote, just gives up and despite having the third highest payroll, won't make the playoffs. These quote unquote favorites had terrible years and will have to regroup and try again next year. They also put several unsuspecting teams in positions to shock the world. With only a few weeks left in the season, teams like the Cubs, Marlins, and Diamondbacks, who entered the year with low expectations, were fighting for the playoffs in the NL. In the AL, the Rangers and Mariners surprisingly competing with the once believed unstoppable Astros, but these six teams were all going after four playoff spots. Setting up an insane final month that was so crazy, it started with a woman reportedly sneaking in a firearm under her belly fat, resulting in two injuries. This happened in the fourth inning. Video shows people looking around, confused, calling for help, and leaving their seats. Two of these women got shot, but nobody else in the stands seemed concerned, heard anything loud, or knew what was going on. The police came to the scene, and despite suggestion that the White Sox cancel the game, the game continued with fans and players having zero awareness of any incident at all. However, the Vanilla Ice concert at the stadium after the game was canceled so police could search the stadium and the investigation began. One report claims that one of the women brought in a weapon and despite setting off the metal detector three times, security never found anything because it was hidden under her belly fat. There was an accidental discharge that hit her and another fan. A different report found zero footage or evidence of a metal detector going off. The woman and her lawyer deny bringing anything into the stadium. The White Sox believe the shot may have came from outside the stadium, and right now, nobody knows for sure what happened, other than the White Sox organization decided to keep the game going, which has caused some criticism. Their opponents, the Oakland Athletics, might have gotten even more after they gifted what might be the worst retirement gift ever. And it might not even be the worst gift Miguel Cabrera has gotten this season. When a legendary player like Miggy retires, teams usually present him with a gift during the last game he plays in that team's stadium. The Angels gave him a surfboard, the Guardians gave him a guitar, the Rangers donated to his charity and gave him a custom horse saddle. The Orioles gave him a brick. However, it did have sentimental value since it came from the Camden Yards warehouse. The Mariners got him a Starbucks gift basket. They also donated to his charity. But the Athletics, who are known for being the cheapest team in the league, got him a bottle of wine that can be found online for $80. To make matters worse, according to a story from 2010, Miguel Cabrera is a recovering alcoholic. The Athletics have been getting roasted online, but to be fair to them, they were not the only team who gifted Miguel Cabrera alcohol during this season. 
Miguel Cabrera's retirement ends the career of one of the greatest hitters of the century, but he is not the only future Hall of Famer leaving his organization this offseason. In fact, there is a good chance the Angels are losing too, after they just had perhaps the most depressing season anyone's ever seen. The Angels shocked the world in July by instead of trading Otani for prospects, knowing he is most likely leaving in free agency, kept him and also traded for arguably the best pitcher available. Lucas Giolito added Ronaldo Lopez as well as Randall Grichik and CJ Krohn, having by far the most aggressive trade deadline in the league. This excited everyone as they sent a message that they were going all in to make the playoffs. Since then, they have the worst record in baseball. And less than a month after giving up several big name prospects to make these trades, the Angels literally gave them away for free. Yes, in an unprecedented move after just trading for them, the Angels decided to put Lucas Giolito, Randall Grichik, and Ronaldo Lopez, as well as Matt Moore and Hunter Renfro on waivers, allowing any team in the league to take them for free as long as they paid their salary in hopes that the Angels could save money and stay under the luxury tax. And after arguably the worst trade deadline ever, things got even worse when Otani tore his UCL. He continued to hit and went off for weeks until he hurt his oblique during batting practice. Shohei was supposed to return, but a week later, reports came out that his locker had been cleaned out. Another video surfaced of Otani landing in Japan circulating rumors that Otani had just got up and left the Angels altogether. This turned out to be false, but the next day, he announced he would miss the rest of the season. He's expected to be unanimous MVP and lead the league in war despite missing a month of the season. And even though he won't pitch an inning next season to rehab, Otani is expected to sign the richest contract in MLB history with a team other than the Angels. Mike Trout, who missed the end of the season as well, might also leave the Angels, who say they are open to trading him. He played 13 seasons in Anaheim, six of them with Otani, and they only made the playoffs once. They got swept. Trout got emotional and almost cried when talking about his injury and the possibility of leaving. But with no real chance of being competitive anytime soon, it's possible Trout and Otani are both leaving Anaheim within the next few months. Yet somehow the biggest disappointment in Anaheim isn't either of them. It's Anthony Rendon, who people think doesn't even like or want to play baseball anymore. This narrative began in Washington when he told reporters he didn't watch baseball because it was too slow and boring, but saying Rendon didn't care about playing was dumb because he became one of the best players in the league and signed a deal with the Angels, making him the eighth highest paid player in baseball. On paper, him, Trout, and Otani should be the most dangerous 1-2-3 in MLB, but over the past three years, he's missed close to 70% of Angels games due to injuries. And this year, those injuries turned into a war with the media. He hurt his wrist in June, and Sam Blum, an Angels beat reporter, asked him how it was doing. He responded by saying, quote, I have two. When he came back two weeks later, he got hurt again with a bone bruise in his shin. Reports expected him to be back by the end of the week. Two weeks later, the same reporter asked him why he wasn't playing. Rendon told him, quote, I'm not here. Two weeks after that, he asked him again. Rendon said he was, quote, on the dead list and did not need to answer questions. A few days later, the reporter said Rendon said he would answer questions, then left, never came back, and never answered questions. A couple weeks after that, the reporter said Rendon said more things to him that he, quote, wouldn't even repeat. Then, a week after that, he asked Rendon why he still wasn't playing, and Rendon responded by saying, quote, no habla inglés today. Finally, two weeks after that, in over two months since Rendon was said to be day-to-day -day with a bone bruise, he told reporters he had a fractured tibia. Rendon apparently saw five doctors. The first four said bone bruise, and the last one said fractured tibia. The Angels told everyone it was just a bone bruise. And why they or Rendon never told the media it was actually a fractured tibia is a mystery. When asked if he considered retiring, he responded by saying he's been contemplating it for 10 years, leaving fans to speculate that Rendon might not want to play, which sucks for the Angels because they're paying him an insane $35 million a year.
When a player like this signs a massive contract and sucks, he typically gets a ton of flack no matter what. Except for Trey Turner, who got a standing ovation from his own fans for being terrible. And it might have saved the Phillies' entire season. Trey Turner signed a $300 million contract to play in Philadelphia, a city known for having the most savage and unforgiving fans in the country. He started off the year by having the worst season of his entire life. He went from hitting second to batting eighth and hit rock bottom when he went 0 for 5 against the Marlins, dropped his average to the lowest it's been all year, and made an error that cost the Phillies the game. He was getting booed throughout his struggles, but before their next game at home, Phillies fan, the Philly captain, made this video. If you're going to a Phillies game this weekend, let's not boo Trey Turner this weekend. Let's give him a standing ovation every time he comes to bat. This message spread throughout the city and the next night, Trey Turner came to the plate and got a massive standing ovation. He kept getting them and in his third at bat, he hit an RBI single. The next day, he had even more standing ovations. He responded by hitting an absolute bomb. The stadium went crazy. He gave the fans a curtain call, and after that weekend, he even bought billboards across the city to thank Philly fans. And somehow, this ovation fixed him overnight. Since then, he's been the third best position player in baseball, according to War. He's gone from hitting 235 to 328, going from being one of the worst hitters on the team to being the best. In fact, the entire team has gotten hot, securing the top and a wildcard spot and bearing an upset are on a path to face Atlanta in the divisional series. The same team they upset last year and after their latest series, they already have beef with them. The Braves have hit more home runs than any team in history. According to WRC+, they are tied for the second best offense of all time behind the 1927 Yankees and are the first team in history to have a slugging percentage over 500. That is the equivalent of having an entire lineup of only David Wrights or Julio Rodriguez's. They have the best record in the league and went into Philly in September, winning three out of four, clinching the division for the sixth year in a row on the back of two Ronald Acuna Jr. homers. After the game, Philly's manager Rob Thompson said he was more of a fan of people who act like they've been there before. Seemingly, a shot at Acuna and the Braves for their celebrations, which the Braves did not like. Their pitcher, Tyler Matzik, responded by saying, quote, if you don't like it, stop it. If you can't stop it, admire it. If you can't admire it, keep it down so everybody else can enjoy the show. The Braves, as well as the Phillies, the Orioles, Rays, and the Dodgers all clinched a playoff spot without much worry of elimination. That can't be said for the rest of the league. In fact, for these three teams, it came down to the last week, featured a manager becoming part of a grounds crew and one of the biggest chokes you'll ever see. But before we get to that, a quick word from today's sponsor. The baseball season is winding down, the playoffs are heating up, and now might be the best time ever to get in on the action with today's sponsor, DraftKings. As sports fans, we all think we have a pretty good idea on who's going to win and who's going to lose. DraftKings Sportsbook lets you put your knowledge to the test. You can bet almost any game in almost any sport. And right now, DraftKings is offering all new customers who bet $5, $200 in bonus bets, Instantly, just download the DraftKings app, use promo code BDE, bet $5 on any wager, win or lose, you will receive $200 in bonus bets instantly. If sports betting is not available in your state, you can still join in with DraftKings Daily Fantasy and have the shot to win cash prizes. So download DraftKings, use promo code BDE, and if you're a new customer, just bet $5 and you're going to get $200 in bonus bets instantly. That's promo code BDE, only at DraftKings Sportsbook. Do it right now. <laughs> the Marlins season makes absolutely zero sense. Their Cy Young pitcher, Sandy Alcantara, is out for their season. Their phenom, Yuri Perez, is also hurt. Jazz Chisholm, their star outfielder, missed most of the season, and they've been outscored by 53 runs this season. Ten different National League teams have a better run differential than the Marlins, yet they still have the fifth best record in the league. The Cubs 
also had low expectations, but saw Cody Bellinger go back to his MVP ways, had two Cy Young candidates come the All-Star break, and surprised the league at the deadline by adding players instead of selling their overachievers. And it paid off. Starting in July, the Cubs rolled, and with three weeks left to play, had a comfortable lead in the wild card with a 92% chance to make the playoffs. But things started to get a little shaky. They lost six out of seven to the Diamondbacks, letting them overtake the Cubs and secure a playoff spot themselves. But they still held a lead over the Marlins, entering a series in Atlanta, got off to a hot start, had a 6-0 lead and a 97% win probability. The Braves battled back, getting the score within one, and in the eighth inning with the go-ahead run on second, the Cubs just needed one more out to go into the ninth with the lead. They got Sean Murphy to hit this routine fly ball to Seiya Suzuki. But it hangs up in the this would have ended the inning and most likely the game, but the Cubs lost. As depressing as this was, the Marlins were even more furious. This loss gave them an opportunity to tie the Cubs with a win over the Mets. Unfortunately, the Mets grounds crew had not covered the field with a tarp on Saturday, even though they knew a tropical storm was coming. So even though it stopped raining, the game had to be postponed because the field was wet. The Marlins' best pitcher Braxton Garrett was supposed to pitch that day, lining him up perfectly to also pitch the last game of the regular season. But since the postponement pushed his start back one day, he no longer was able to pitch the last game of the season, which might have been the most important game of the year, all because of the grounds crew. This was a massive help for the Cubs, who rallied early against the Braves and in the ninth came up clutch to take the lead. They only needed two more outs to secure a win. Marcelo Zuna hit a bomb. The Cubs went on to lose in extras, blowing the second game in two days. They were now tied with the Marlins. The next day, they lost again. Getting swept during the biggest series of the year, a Marlins win would put them in sole possession of the final playoff spot. And down late in the ninth, Jazz Chisholm hit a clutch double. Yuli Gurriel knocked him in with a single, and they were three outs away from winning the game. It started raining again. The game was delayed, and the problem was the Marlins were playing in Pittsburgh the next day. Neither team had any more off days left, so rescheduling this game was nearly impossible. So three hours later, when the rain briefly stopped, the Marlins were adamant they play. So adamant, their manager literally started helping the grounds crew take the tarp off the field. They still couldn't get the field ready in time. It started raining again. The Marlins manager lost it, yelling at the grounds crew at around 1 a.m. And with no chance to finish the game, the Marlins now had to fly to Pittsburgh, land at 6 a.m. to play that day. We're only a half game up because they never got to finish against the Mets and potentially had to fly back after the series and the season was over to play one more inning and finish the game, all because, at least according to the Marlins, the grounds crew sucked. Luckily, that never had to happen. The Cubs went to Milwaukee, who played the Seiya Suzuki error on the Jumbotron to troll them, made two costly feeling mishaps that cost them three runs and lost, essentially killing their season, ending a 7-13 stretch that saw their playoff odds go from 92% to 0% in three weeks. Having playoff odds over 90%, then ultimately not making the playoffs is without a doubt a choke, which is what made the AL West unique. It featured three teams that at one point had playoff odds over 90%. However, as the season winded down, it became clear it was only gonna be possible for two of these teams to make the playoffs, guaranteeing that at least one of them would experience a painful downfall, and it was more painful than people imagined. The Rangers were projected to finish fourth in the division. They became one of the biggest surprises of the year. They controlled first for a total of 138 days. At the trade deadline, they added Max Scherzer and became a playoff lock with a 95% chance to make the playoffs with a month and a half left to play. Then out of nowhere, 
they began to suck. Since then, they've had the third worst bullpen in baseball and have blown an insane 14 saves. Their playoff odds went from 95% to 38%, an insane 60% drop in only three weeks, where they not only got swept by their division rivals, but got outscored 39 to 10. And just when things couldn't get any worse, Max Scherzer got hurt and was ruled out for the rest of the regular season. The Astros, who won the division six years in a row, went to the ALCS six years in a row, and won the World Series last year, all of a sudden were in first and had a 98% chance to make the playoffs. But even that couldn't last. In an event nobody saw coming, they lost three series in a row to the two worst teams in baseball, going two and seven against the Royals and the Athletics. The division was once again wide open and while the Rangers had fallen from grace, another unsuspecting team was moving in the opposite direction. Last season, the Mariners made history. They hadn't made the playoffs in 20 years. In fact, since 1980, the Mariners had more ruptured testicles than playoff appearances. Mike Parrott went down with two of them. Josias Mazzania went down after taking a 112 mile per hour line drive to the balls. Adrian Beltre went down with one in 2010 and so did Mitch Hanniger in 2019. That's five ruptured testicles in a span. They only made the playoffs four times. Then they shocked everyone, making a late season push, making the playoffs and even advancing to the ALDS. And in 2023, they were doing it again. Going into July, they were 10 games back. At the end of July, only had a 14% chance to make the playoffs. Then Julio Rodriguez went off, setting an MOB record, recording four or more hits in four straight games. During a stretch where he had 17 hits in just four games. That's more hits than the entire Yankees offense had during that same stretch. On the back of Julio Rodriguez, the Mariners went 14 and three, went from third place to first place, and went from having a 30% chance to make the playoffs to having a 90% chance to make the playoffs. An insane 60% jump in only two weeks. They were in first place, but just like Houston and Texas, they couldn't hold it. They lost 11 of 16 to start September. With nine games left, all three of these teams were within a half game of each other. But with two wildcard spots essentially set, only two of them can make it. And it just so happened, every single one of the Mariners' nine final games were against these two teams. It started off terribly for them, getting swept by the Rangers. All of a sudden, they were in a power position with a two and a half game hold on the division. Still, the Mariners only a half game back of the Astros going into a series against them were in a good position. Things got ugly. The first two games were split, and in the rubber match, the Mariners went up early. Houston responded with an onslaught, and the Mariners came back with runs of their own. They found themselves down one in the fourth. Julio Rodriguez came up to the plate as the go-ahead run, and in the biggest spot in the game, Hector Neris struck him out, then ran right after him. This aggressive reaction surprised everyone, including Julio Rodriguez. The benches cleared, people were held back, and eventually separated. Apparently, these two are friends, but according to Eugenio Suarez, Neris called Julio Rodriguez a homophobic slur during the altercation. MOB is investigating the matter, but Harris denied saying anything like that and apologize. Yet according to Julio Rodriguez's comments, he hinted he may never talk to Neris again. The Mariners ended up losing in another crucial game, meaning they essentially had to sweep the Rangers in a four-game series to advance. And with a one-run lead in the ninth, the Rangers brought in Aroldis Chapman to end the Mariners' season for good. He gave up a hit, gave up another hit, walked a batter, and was immediately taken out of the game. It looked like their bullpen had screwed them over again, but Jonathan Hernandez came in and got a pop-up, then got another pop-up, and all of a sudden, the Mariners were down to their last out, and it was up to J.P. Crawford. On the line. Slicing drive. The Mariners took this momentum into the next game, crushing the Rangers, and with all the momentum, they were two wins away from punching their ticket. 
Then the Rangers, once and for all, ended the Mariners' season. A month earlier, they had a 90% chance to make the playoffs, but on the second to last game of the year, it dropped to 0%. The next day, Houston clinched the division for the seventh year in a row, while the Rangers secured the second wildcard spot. And with that, the playoff field was set. Some teams we knew were gonna be there, other teams we didn't. And we don't know how it's gonna end, but if it's anything like the regular season, it's gonna be weird.